everyone, and welcome to the 84th episode of the Atlas Society Asks. My name is Jennifer Anju Grossman. My friends call me JAG. I'm the CEO of the Atlas Society. We are the leading organization introducing young people to the ideas of Ayn Rand in fun, creative ways like animated videos and graphic novels. Today, we are joined by Alex Kaczynski. Before I even start to introduce him, I wanted to remind those of you who are watching us on Zoom, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, um, on YouTube, to go ahead, use the comment sections, type in any questions you have for uh, Alex Kaczynski, and we will get to as many of them as possible. So our guest today, Alex Kaczynski, is a Romanian-born jurist and lawyer who presided as a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit from 1985 to 2017. He is the son of Romanian Holocaust survivors. He describes having become an instant and fervent capitalist once he stepped foot beyond the Soviet's Iron Curtain. He is a staunch defender of the First Amendment. He shepherded many of his law clerks onto clerkships uh, on the Supreme Court. Over the years, he has made a name for himself with his readable uh, and colorful court opinions. Alex, welcome again, and thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Jennifer. So Alex, uh, my great-grandparents also came from Romania, though I haven't had the chance to ever visit. Um, I know you left with your parents when you were 12, so you may not have uh, too many memories, but do you have any distinctive memories about what it was like to grow up there at that time? Uh, I was actually 11, uh, and I do remember it very well. Uh, I remember Bucharest like the back of my hand. I spent a lot of time uh, traveling uh, the city. Uh, my mother taught me how to cross the street um, when I was six. And after that, I had pretty much free reign to go anywhere. My parents weren't exactly- uh, Helicopter the, parents. You were the original <laughs> free range kid. Uh, so uh, I remember Romania very well. Um, I, um, you know, my, my father was a communist and uh, he was a um, member of the party uh, before the war. And then he spent most of the war in concentration camps because he was a Jew and a communist and um, survived. And then he had the misfortune of being a communist idealist to actually see communism in action. And he was, <laughs> it, it didn't work out as he had thought it would. Uh, he saw the greed, he saw the corruption, he saw the self-dealing, he saw the, um, the restrictions on freedom, uh, none of which he expected, none of which was advertised when he, or um, talked about when he was joining the party before the war. But we actually had a pretty good life there. Um, my, my father being a member of the party, of uh, the Communist Party, he had a very good job. And my mother had a very good job. And by Romanian standards, we were living you know, reasonably well. Um, but my parents decided there was no future for me under that system and um, decided to do what was considered an act of treason, uh, which is to leave um, asked to leave Romania. Uh, they asked to leave in 1958, uh, and um, my, both of my parents got kicked out of their jobs, and there was post of ostracism. Uh, but eventually, we were, we were let go. Um, you know, that, that said, uh, we, my parents never talked uh, or taught me anything against communism while we were there. Um, it was a dangerous thing to do. Uh, one can get into very serious trouble if, uh, and one time I said something and got my father into trouble. Fortunately, he managed to get out of it. What, uh, what, do you remember what that was? Or Oh, yes, I remember very well. I, I, uh, I was in his office and he was in such a meeting. So I was in the uh, other room, the other room where his uh, co-workers were. 
And um, somebody said, how old are you? I said, well, I'm seven years old. He says, can you read? I said, of course I can read. And so they picked up a newspaper that says, well, read this. And the newspaper was called Romania Liber, Liber, which means free Romania. So I'm a little bit of a wise guy. Uh, so I read it and I said, uh, you know, Romania Liber, but why do they call it Romania Liber, free Romania, when there are all these people in prison? Uh oh. And, you know, I didn't say anything about political prisoners or anything else. And I didn't really particularly mean anything by it, except I was trying to sort of be a wise guy. Well, my father got in some serious trouble for that. And, um, and you know, eventually they were persuaded that this was just a kid talking. This was not, didn't reflect what I was being taught at home. And um, he, um, um, we got out of it, but after that, he said, "If I'm ever, you know, with you, and there's somebody else present, and you are saying something, uh, I'll give you this signal. <laughs> if I do that, you stop talking. You, in the middle of a sentence, you don't end the sentence. You don't do anything. You just stop talking right then." And it happened a couple of times, and I thought, "Well, if I did that, people, you know, four of us." You know, the other adult would say, well, what did you mean, kid? You know, continue or something like that. But no, nobody wanted to hear. So, you know, whenever my father gave me the signal, I shut up. And um, uh, nobody, nobody thought it was strange or unusual. They just went on. Um, but, you know, I, um, I was, uh, you know, I had a pretty happy childhood. I had good relationship with my parents, and I believed in communism. I uh, I thought it was a great system. I didn't know anything else. You know, it seemed pretty good to me. And uh, I was told daily and hourly that this is a great system. We owe everything we have to the, to the party. And we thank the party from the depth of our heart for all the things they give us. And this was a just constant refrain. And, uh, you know, I was a pioneer. I wore a red neckerchief proudly, and I used to give the pioneer salute. Uh, and, uh, uh, and when I found out that I would be leaving and going behind the Iron Curtain into places where capitalism reigned, um, I, you know, I had seen pictures in, in, uh, in the newsreels uh, and all the pictures of New York were shown as dark and people oppressed and lynchings and all sorts of uh, horrible things. And I thought to myself, well, I, I, am, uh, I, am, I have an advantage. I, I grew up enlightened with <laughs> communism and I would take all this teaching that I have with me. And once I you know, get to that prison that's the West, I would teach the workers all about the joys of, of communism. And I would start a movement and help free them of the yoke of capitalism. Um, and um, we left Romania and um, um, wound up in Vienna. And um, uh, first day we were there, we went out and there was this, you know, we went to an outdoor market and um, in Romania, you, you couldn't get bananas. Uh, it was very rare. And if you did, they were little, so sort of beat up ones more brown than yellow. And I thought they were the best delicacy in the world. And first thing we see is this pile of bananas. They were sort of yellow and sort of brown, uh, but there was a big pile of them. So we thought we'd better grab these. <laughs> who knows? They might not have any uh, by the time we, we get out. So we bought five kilograms of bananas. We filled them up. And um, and then we went a little further in, and it turns out these were the bad bananas. The the stands further on had bananas that were completely yellow, and some of them were green, and all sorts of fruit, and all sorts of meat, and all sorts of. Well, I don't remember the transition. I don't remember the transition, but I became an instant capitalist. I I I uh, it was it was not a it was not a. Um, uh, conscious decision it was um, it just happened and uh, after you know it just 
that and bubblegum and chocolate, all those things that we didn't have in Romania uh, made, me, um, uh, made me an instant capitalist. Maybe we should try that. We could package uh, chocolate bars with capital, chocolate brought to you by capitalism and, and ship them to, uh, to Cuba. Well, it's a little different now, I think, because of the internet. Um, I remember the only access we had to the West were newspapers and newsreels. Uh, the, the, if you went to a movie, and I saw a lot of American movies and really liked them. I, I still remember many of them uh, very well. Uh, I mean, I have images of, you know, War and Peace and Marty and Five Fingers and, you know, other American movies. And thinking those are great movies. Uh, I still think they're great movies. Uh, but um, before the movie started, they'd have a newsreel. And they always painted things in the Soviet Union and Romania and other advanced communist countries as being rosy and wonderful. And the, the West was always painted as black and, you know, we weren't told anything. But um, uh, about... Uh, uh, about, uh, um, I'm sorry, I had a phone go off. Uh, anyway, uh, so I think things are a little different now. I think with uh, video, uh, I mean, Romania was transformed by the VHS. Uh, there's a movie uh, uh, about uh, Romania and how there were bootleg videos and Chuck Norris was a big star. You know, it's so really considered to be a, a, a big, uh, people were very um, uh, fond of his movies and uh, they would bootleg these VHS videos and have these sessions in people's homes where they would watch Chuck Norris movies. I think the movie is called Chuck Norris versus Communism or something, something that's what well was watching. It's, it gives a very good idea of mm. what life was like, but that was a window into the West. People got the idea then uh, even with that low, so techno low, low tech technology, that things were not in the West as portrayed by the party. Uh, I'm guessing, uh, you know, I don't know what the internet situation is in Cuba, but I think it's very much harder uh, in, 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 in uh, repressive places now to, to lie about what's going on. Uh, yeah. I think Cuba right now, it, it, they especially, you know, they've cracked down since these artistic um, protests in San Isidro and um, they're not able to even access uh, the internet. But uh, what you're saying about being able to see some of these films and how these early, you know, bootlegged copies of movies, uh, Yon Mi Park, who, escape from North Korea, she, she talks about having seen the Titanic, you know, and how that was so pivotal in kind of giving her a sense that there was this world out there where romance and where beauty and uh, where creativity was possible. And then, of course, Ayn Rand, who I know was also an influence on you uh, when she was uh, growing up after the, the Bolshevik revolution and, and that her family's you know, business and home had been um, appropriated, that she would still go to the cinema. And even though it, it, they were kind of repurposed uh, Soviet films taking clips and trying to make you know, the capitalists seem like uh, the villains, she could see though, there was something out there. There was a place where there were skyscrapers and where there were people dressed beautifully and drinking champagne, so. Well, Ayn Rand was smarter than I am, so uh, she, she had, uh, she had uh, a lot of vision. Uh, she also, I believe, uh, if I remember from, uh, from various things I read, she actually lived in pre-revolutionary Russia. Yes. So she did have some idea of what things- Of were, what came before. Uh, yeah, she was actually about, the, the, the age that you left Romania was the age where uh, she, she witnessed the Bolshevik revolution. So, um, and, then, and then she eventually got out when I think she was 21. So you uh, arrived in California, speaking of popular culture, 
And you wasted no time kind of getting into the swing of things and even made your TV debut on the dating game, uh, which I've seen a clip of. So, and you, which you won. So how, how did that happen? Uh, well, uh, actually, when we uh, came to the United States, we lived in Baltimore. Baltimore, not Baltimore. Baltimore, if you're from Baltimore. <laughs> and um, uh, for about five years, but the weather got to be too difficult for my mother. And so she, she um, uh, we moved to a warmer climate. Uh, we thought of Florida first, and then, and then um, we went to um, California. Uh, but anyway, we, um, uh, my father got a grocery store uh, next to, um, uh, across Kitty Corner from ABC Studios. And at that time, um, um, the dating game was on there and the newlywed game and Lawrence Welk and uh, people used to walk in all the time from the studio. So I started seeing these sort of pimply guys uh, with... Um, suits coming in to get a drink before they went to the studio. And I finally asked one of them, what are you here for? And he says, oh, I'm going to be on a dating game. And I look at him, I said, well, well if that guy can be on a dating game, <laughs> I can be on a dating game. So I called up um, uh, the production company, uh, which had an office on Vine Street, not too far from where we were. And they said, come in for an interview. And uh, we gathered there and there were a bunch of guys and then a bunch of girls on the other side of the partition. And they say, play the game. Uh, so the girls were supposed to come with questions and they asked the guys questions and the guys were supposed to answer them. So I got on. And um, then uh, when, um, when um, my day came for the show, they, I went to the studio and they showed us around. They said, here's a stage. And, they cautioned us, you know, don't have anybody in the audience giving any signals. They're not supposed to give signals, uh, I guess, to the woman who would pick as, you know, who's the handsomest guy or something. Um, uh, but anyway, they, they gave us all these cautions. And then the guy turns to us and says, look, this is not about winning the show. This is about being asked back. So mm. what I want you to do is you want to give answers that are as risque as possible. Step close to the line, as close to the line you can, but don't say anything really dirty. Mm -hmm. The trick will be the more risque your answer is without stepping on the line, the better, and then you'll get asked back on the show. Uh, so I, uh, I must have done okay, because I got asked back a couple of times, and uh, uh, the second time I actually won. Uh, a trip to Guadalajara. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, so uh, from sort of uh, lowbrow culture to highbrow culture, at some point you discovered Ayn Rand and uh, I, I, you have read more Ayn Rand than you know even many people that are a part of the Atlas Society. So how did that all come about? Uh, well, I was always... Um, skeptical of, of um, sort of campus liberalism. Most of my classmates or most of my colleagues, or, uh, students, professors were pretty liberal and I, I was pretty skeptical. I had seen what all of that leads to and I was always pretty skeptical. So I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, I remember, and um, he said, you know, you really ought to eat, uh, read Ayn Rand. And I said, who is that? He says, oh, it's this old lady that writes sexy novels. <laughs> Not right. Uh, well, no, I, I uh, you know, so th that didn't sound particularly interesting to me. Uh, I, uh, but then I was in a bookstore one day, so we used bookstore, and there was the fountainhead. So um, I opened it up and I read and it said, Howard Rourke laughed. And I said, wow, what a way to start an owl. <laughs> so I bought the book and I got a gross in it. How it work left, that was it. That's what hooked me in. Um, and, and then over the course of, would you say the fiction or the, the nonfiction? Um, well, I, I, I read the fiction. Uh, I read, uh, I think, 
uh, Adler Schlag was next, and maybe uh, Anthem, and right of January 16th. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember the exact sequence, but I, I started just acquiring her stuff. And at that time, um, she was, first of all, she was appearing yearly on the Fort Hall Forum. So you could, you could um, listen to her live. I guess she'd be in Boston. We'd listen on the radio in, in you know, in Los Angeles where, where we were, my roommate and I. And, um, and she also had something called the Ayn Rand Letter. Uh, and I subscribed to that. So I would get this in the mail. I would get this uh, um, essay by her uh, once a month. I don't know. It, it, it came pretty regular for a long time. And then I found the, the various uh, nonfiction books, uh, the, the Virtue of Selfishness, uh, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. Uh, and I read my way through all of those. And um, uh, then I, later on, when there was the internet, I was able to sort of dig up some other stuff like the, uh, was it NBI, NBI newsletter? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I haven't actually kept all of it. I, I, I read some of it, uh, but I don't have any of my Iron letters. I wish I wish I had kept them, but uh, I, I haven't. But I still have um, my original copy of uh, I, I, my copy of Atlas Shrugged is the original '57 um, edition, which I also got used uh, mm -hmm. in, a, in a bookstore with the rails and the, and the locomotive on the cover, and um, I, it was pretty neat. Uh, yeah, I, I'm still I, uh, all things told, I, I still prefer the Fountainhead. Uh, yeah, and I've, seen, I've seen the movie. Uh, I've seen the movie of, uh, there's an Italian version of We the Living. We the Living. Mm -hmm. uh, and you appeared in, uh, Atlas, in the Atlas Shrugged trilogy. Oh, yes. I, I think I was the highlight. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> I, was, I was one of the judges on the, on the, I forget what it's called, the Reconciliation Court. Or the, yeah. Um, but I didn't have a speaking role. Um, they just wanted me. That was case. clearly, clearly an oversight. Um, so we we actually have quite a few very interesting questions coming in, and I want to okay. let all of you watching uh, know that I'm not ignoring you. We're going to get to those, but I, I can't end um, up talking about Ayn Rand without asking about the review uh, that you wrote in the Wall Street Journal of Nathaniel Brandon's book Judgment Day. I, I thought it was a very interesting um it, it wasn't you know overly critical or overly uh i think um agreeing but um you talked about rand's fictional characters or fictional heroes uh as inspiring abstractions but uh not necessarily um people that you'd want to try to emulate in in real life i i don't know if you have any thoughts on on that review or or the reception well, I, I, um, I had, uh, as I recall, uh, Barbara's book came out first. Uh, both Barbara and Nathaniel Brandon wrote books relating essentially the same story uh, in a somewhat different way. And I liked Barbara's book a lot. I, I saw the movie too with um, uh, Helen, Helen Mirren, Mirren. Yeah. As, as Ayn Rand. And I thought the movie was good too. Um, you know, I knew Nathaniel and respected and liked him quite a bit um but i thought his book i mean just the name judgment day mm -hmm. it was uh, it was not helpful mm -hmm. and it set the wrong tone for the book so i i had wanted to be more enthusiastic in my wall street journal review uh, i remember he called me and he was disappointed with it once it came out um but um you know the whole story has sort of almost a Greek tragedy. I mean, if one can believe what you're told in the two books and the stories I've heard from other people, uh, it had uh, sort of the makings of a Greek tragedy. Uh, it, it paints Rand in a not totally favorable light, um, and uh, she had many. Um, many virtues and she's clearly a visionary and saw all sorts of things coming that, that nobody else did. 
Uh, and um, I mean, like for example, in 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 Anthem, um, using the 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 words we instead of I. Yes. Now the now the pronoun is they. Right. You, you use they for a, for a single individual uh, because um, you don't want to say he or she because it might not be a he or a she or might not be either of them. Uh, but uh, she saw a lot of stuff coming that uh, that few had the vision to see. No one really, if you think back to the 50s when she was writing in the 40s, when she was writing, uh, was writing The Fountainhead um, and well into the 60s, uh, nobody had a vision to see. So she was a great genius and, and, and a great visionary. Um, but you know she was also authoritarian and um, and unforgiving and um, uh, she had this view about human nature that was not complete. Um, uh, there's a tape by Nathaniel Brandon. Uh, I got a cassette one time called "The Virtues and uh, Perhaps Detriments of Ayn Rand's Philosophy." Uh, I, I have the audio. I can send it to you after this. Uh, I, I okay. recorded the. I had the video. I don't know where it is on my computer, but I will. I will find it. Uh, and it's actually quite good. It, it's. It's not. The, the audio itself is not um, uh, in any way judgmental or. or uh, I think it, it gives her. It fully gives Rand her due. Um, but the reality is there are aspects of the human psyche that I don't think are fully explored in the books. And that's fine. They're novels. Uh, and, you know, you build your characters to make certain points. And, but, um, you know, I admire Howard Rourke. I, I think uh, he's a heroic character. I think what he did was uh, magnificent. Would I want him as a friend? I don't know. I don't think so. I, I uh, um, uh, he is cold. Uh, he is introverted. Uh, he is um, unforgiving of human foibles, and uh, I don't think those are. I think those are, uh, you know, like generosity, charity. I mean, you know, uh, um, benevolence. Yeah. The, the, I, I the, love... Those are those are human um, uh, drives. Uh, I don't know what other people, I, I don't want credit if I help somebody. I, I, I don't want even to be thanked. It makes me feel good to help somebody. And when they then come back and say, oh, thank you, I'm, I'm sort of embarrassed by it. I didn't do it for them. I did it because I think that's a human thing to do because it feeds some uh, value in myself. And the rant for her, her you know, many, many, many uh, uh, excellent ideas and uh, many um, very perceptive views of human nature just didn't see that part or didn't portray it in her in, in her fiction. Yeah, I think well, it was I, good. I, I I still like it. I <laughs> I know you do, and and now we uh, we've sent a care package, and we're going to be uh, helping to cultivate some some future Rand fans and perhaps even objectivists in the Kaczynski household with our graphic novels, but uh, yes, indeed, yes. I, thank you. I got <laughs> what, what you say resonates with, with me and with the view that we take at the Atlas Society. We've been you know, extremely emphatic about not conflating uh, the ideas originated by Ayn Rand with the person of Ayn Rand. And also um, we promote open objectivism, which is a, a view that um, uh, we can continue to build on those ideas, to develop those ideas that Ayn Rand lived at a certain time and for so many years, um, so that, uh, that, that we can continue to develop the philosophy. And also um, David Kelly, the founder of that, the Atlas Society, has uh, elevated benevolence um, and done a lot of philosophical work on benevolence as a self-interested virtue, you know, in, in his book, Unrugged individualism. So um, so I think we, we would be simpatico. You would feel- Let me give out a shout out to Linda Abrams, who just uh, just sent me a- text Oh, good. Message. Um, we met in law school uh, when she was desperately looking for another person to 
uh, Justify Libertarian Bulletin Board. Mm -hmm. uh, and Linda was actually responsible for um, introducing me to my wife indirectly. Uh, when she graduated a couple of years uh, before I did, she passed the baton on to my wife, Marcy Tiffany, mm -hmm. uh, who and then said, well, who am I going to find? You, you actually need three actual people to, to, um, to um, justify having a bulletin board. You actually physically have to go down and, and you know, show yourself that you're a, a real person. So Linda recommended me, but she says, watch out for him. He's a wolf. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, that's what Linda said? Uh, that's what... My wife's what Marcy said. Linda said, and oh, Linda, Linda. That, so that was Linda, because I've actually heard this story told before, but I, I, I didn't realize that our very own Linda Abrams uh, was was played such a central part in that um, yes. in that very important story. Yeah. So anyway, she. Um, um, so my Marcy came to me um, and said. I need your body. And um, I you said, sure. Yeah, yeah I, I knew there was a catch. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, what for? She says, well, I need you to walk down with me to Murphy Hall, the administ or the Ackerman or whatever, the administration building to sign up for Libertarian Bulletin Board. And I said, no, I'm a real Libertarian. I don't join anything. And so she kicked me. Uh, and <laughs> That's how it all started. Wow, I know. Well, we are going to have a, to... A, a libertarian romance. We're, we are going to have story. to uh, get, get Linda to, to drag you to our, uh, to our gala. Um, we've had it two years in a row in Malibu. So. But, you know, um, uh, seeing Linda reminds me, um, you know, libertarians um, or people who sort of a libertarian objectivist, uh, you know, they, they, many of them tend to follow in Rand's footsteps and being very doctrinaire. I remember Linda dragged me one time to something called the Libertarian Supper Club, and I think there was a meeting in San Pedro. And at that time, there was before the Ninth Circuit, I was chief judge of the Court of Federal Claims. And one of the kind of claims we used to hear were um, takings claims, claims by individuals that the government took their property sometimes by overregulation. So I talked about that and I said, you know, this is a way of keeping government in check by making them pay when they have excessive regulation. I got a very negative reaction uh, from a, a lot of people there who said, well, you are just in favor of taking taxpayers' money and giving it to, to um, plaintiff's lawyers, um, uh, which I thought was an interesting perspective, but... Uh, um, I, I think I think I think a little bit of flexibility and 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 realizing we live in this world, not some other world. Not, we don't live in the world of Atlas Shrugged. I think is 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 uh, is is a good thing. Yes. Well, I, as Linda will be able to attest, uh, that is the the nature uh, of the Atlas Society. We do get. Uh, attacked or criticized for being too too open, too inclusive, um, and not sort of doctrinaire enough. So I think you... Yeah, I, I, I'm, by the way, I didn't mean to implicate Linda at all, except that she is the one that dragged me to that meeting or invited me and had me come to the meeting. Uh, she's not like that at all. No, she's not. She's uh, not. So which I, is... I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to suggest that she was. Uh... No, no. We, we know that. We know Linda well. Okay, we've got a lot of questions here. Uh, we're probably not going to be able to get to all of them. So I'm going to ask some of those I think you might have something to say about. But if you don't, let us know and we'll move on to the next. Okay, Scott Schiff, who's been uh, a part of our community for a long time, is asking about uh, whether objectivity in the legal field has been compromised by critical legal theory or critical race theory in, in recent years. Oh, Are you seeing well. influences of critical legal theory? Uh, certainly uh, has, but I think one has to put this in context. Um, uh, the move away from objective rules is 50 years in the making. Um, uh, it, it, it started at least 50 years ago and uh, maybe longer with legal realism. And um, it, um, it, it morphed 
and not ever more doctrinaire. Uh, but um, when I was going to law school and when Linda was going to law school, uh, same law school uh, in the mid seventies, uh, what was in vogue was legal realism, the idea that um, there really are no rules, there are only judges. And um, if you're a judge, you can decide the case any way you want to. And the rest of it is just scribblings. You, you explain your decision, mm -hmm. but you can always. So in deciding what the law is, you don't read rules or cases or precedents. Uh, what you do is you try to predict uh, what judges will do. And one of the ways uh, you can predict is by figuring out who the judge is. Um, um, uh, or, you know, and this is uh, a little bit tongue in cheek, but they say you have to figure out what the judge had for breakfast. Uh, and depending on what mood the judge is in uh, may affect whether, uh, you know, if you're if you're there for sentencing and the judge had a good breakfast and feeling in a jolly mood, you might get six months, but if the judge has an indigestion, you might wind up getting 10 years. And that's just one kind of decision judges make, but this uh, is a proxy for the many kind of uh, discretionary decisions judges make. Um, it, it's, it was surprising to me, it shouldn't be, but it was surprising to me just how many legal issues are unresolved. We don't know the answer because either the case, is, the issue has never been presented or the precedents are unclear or because a statutory language is conflicting or sometimes you know, if you're looking at individual disputes, contracts are uh, ambiguous or conflicting. Um, so there's an underlying layer of uncertainty. And what law schools were pushing, and I think all of us uh, who went to law school at that time and since that time have um, sort of been imbued with the idea that don't worry too much about the facts. Don't worry too much about the rules. Uh, just decide what feels good or what what what, we do, what you think is a just result. And um, you know, then a law clerk or somebody will write a decision that make that sound plausible. Uh, that your job really is to determine justice as you uh, as you understand it in your gut, not as this in applying the law. Um, that can be overstated a little bit, but not that much. Uh, critical um, uh, uh, legal theory and critical race theory have pushed that uh, to a further extreme, and that is to say uh, you not only can do that, but you must do that. You should do that uh, because uh, law is really not a set of objective rules. It is a set of power relationships and if you're in a position of power, it is your responsibility to push uh, for uh, interpretations that, that uh, support uh, one side of the dispute rather than mm -hmm. the other. That is the very antithesis of, uh, of, of uh, objective uh, decision-making, objective law, of impartiality. It is, uh, it is really a question of now I've got life tenure, um, what can I do to help achieve the ends uh, that, that, you know, I think society should go to. Um, and Got there's it. no one, um, no one, uh, or very few people in the federal judiciary who, who or on the state judiciary for that matter, that really uh, don't buy into that, into that, uh, you know, Justice Thomas doesn't, um, Justice Scalia, Mostly didn't, um, mostly didn't, and, and he was a great advocate, but it's, it's, um, it's objective decision-making is something that, um, that is little practiced anymore. Uh, it still happens, but it's, 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 yeah, on the way. Okay, we got another yeah. question coming in uh, on Instagram from Camden, Camden GTR. Uh, asking about your thoughts on um, media companies trying to find out the identities of jurists in big cases. He was pointing to the Kyle Rittenhouse case as an example. Well, 
you don't need to be a big media company, you know, it's a uh, court. Uh, we have a long tradition that courtrooms are open and that you know who your judges are. Uh, I would dread a system where the judges were secret as they are in the FISA court, uh, uh, the Federal Intelligence Court. And we know who they are, but, but they, they, keep, they keep a really, pretty low profile. Um, so I don't think there's any uh, great art to finding out who the judge in a particular case is. You go to the clerk's office, you look at the case number, the initials of the judge follow the case number. So if, if you don't otherwise know, you can, you can find out pretty easily. Um, what is, uh, what is more, far more troubling is the attempt to put pressure on judges uh, by um, uh, disclosing their home addresses, uh, by disclosing their telephone numbers uh, and uh, uh, names of their family members and so on. And that is a very troubling trend. Uh, I don't know if that comes from, from big tech companies. I think that comes from a lot of uh, people on Instagram, <laughs> you know, which, which is one of the reasons I have no social media accounts whatsoever. Uh, all right, on YouTube, Joe Clemo is um, asking, do you remember the Deborah Milky. Milk? You know, Milky case, oh, of yeah, course. And if anything came of the federal investigation into it. I don't know, and maybe our, our viewers don't, so maybe if you could tell us what that was. You know, I don't know that anything came of it. Um, I mean, Deborah Mulkey was uh, convicted um, uh, of a very serious crime of, of, of killing her son, uh, participating in the killing of her son. And um, the only evidence um, presented was, uh, was an oral confession. So this was not even a written or signed. She went to the room with a detective um, and was in there, I don't forget whether it was 20 minutes or 40 minutes, and they came out and she said, I didn't tell him anything. And he said, she confessed. And based on that, she was sentenced. I forget whether it was life in prison or death. Uh, and um, uh, it turns out the cop was a dirty cop. It turns out the cop was, uh, was somebody who would fake confessions, would coerce confessions. That was his specialty. They would call him in to get a confession. Um, so I remember the case very well. Uh, and uh, she was, in fact, released. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've said this before. I don't know whether she's guilty or innocent. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, um, but we have a legal system. And you're presumed innocent until it is proven you are guilty in a court of law following um, ordinary um, due process procedures. Uh, and included in that is that witnesses don't lie and that you don't have um, uh, uh, confessions uh, either extracted by force or by, by, um, uh, by coercion or lied about. And uh, we can't have a system where people get put in prison because they have the bad luck of drawing uh, a cop uh, who, whose specialty is to fake confessions. Uh, and so to me, that is doing justice, uh, whether in some cosmic sense, or if you sort of look from above, or if there's a deity you know, looking down, um, uh, he would think this is justice. Uh, I don't know. But we, we can't apply that kind of justice. We can only apply justice uh, uh, that is available using human tools, which don't include magic or mind reading, or uh, although we're getting closer to mind reading these days. Uh, certainly with all the surveillance, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's getting mighty close. But whatever these tools are, uh, we have to follow human rules by human standards uh, to reach a result. And when you reach that result using correctly applying the tools uh, impartially, the result you get is justice, by my definition. Got it. All right. Well, we've got many other interesting questions here, but we also have just about 15 
minutes. Um, Hank Laysom on uh, Instagram asked about why objectivism should be an open system. So Hank, I'm going to recommend that you join uh, me tomorrow on Clubhouse. I'm going to be talking with the founder of the Out Society philosopher, David Kelly, and he would be the source to be the best one to answer uh, those questions. But um, Alex, so you and I both live in California, um, which is a state that despite having some of the strictest lockdowns, school closures, mass mandates, has not had significantly um, better outcomes with COVID than states uh, like Florida with more minimal interventions. Uh, now, I, I know you're a legal rather than a health expert, uh, and I'm gonna get to your views on um, the constitutionality of some of the administration's mandates and policies, but I'd like to just see as a California resident, as somebody who has uh, been around, thought deeply about um, civil liberties, uh, about the way our uh, society should um, should function, and, and the way um, how, any thoughts on the way our government and uh, the American people have responded to the pandemic in general. You know, this is another area where Rand was um, was prescient. She, uh, if you read her books, uh, she um, foretold or uh, predicted that fear, fear is the one factor that will cause populations to do things that are otherwise unthinkable. And um, that's what happened to us. Uh, we've been the target of a fear monitoring campaign. I I've lived through a real pandemic. I lived through the 1957 um, Asian flu in, uh, in Bucharest killed a lot of people, killed a lot of small children. I used to walk Bucharest and there were coffins stacked up, including tiny coffins of babies. Um, there were so many that you, they, they, they couldn't handle them. Um, and, you know, life didn't, didn't stop. Uh, so even in communist Romania, nobody thought we're going to lock everybody uh, in their homes or, 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 or prevent uh, gatherings. Uh, it's just unthinkable what's been going on for the last two years. It's unthinkable that in America, um, the land uh, of the brave and the home of the free, or maybe it's the home of the brave, the land of the free, um, that we would show as much cowardice and as much subservience uh, to government dictates that have absolutely no rationality. Um, uh, the idea that the government could force you to inject something into yourself um, uh, that is now pretty clear has no lasting effect and no lasting, you know, it's just unthinkable. Um, and the idea that the government can tell me to wear a mask. You know, I used to wear the red neckerchief of the party. My parents wore the yellow star. I'm not ever going to let the government tell me once again what to wear in public. This is the, this is uh, on private for that matter. Uh, I will not wear a mask. I have not worn a mask. I, I simply won't do it. Um, and uh, I think it is um, just astonishing to me that we have come as far as we have, um, uh, and people have submitted basically out of fear, uh, misplaced fear. I think um, I'm not a scientist, but I have I have read up on. Uh, COVID pretty carefully, like Omicron now. I mean, it's it's it, it should be a godsend. It should be people should be uh, doing cartwheels in the street. It's mm -hmm. highly infectious and not very dangerous. Look at the data from South Africa. Look at the data from Denmark. Uh, uh, people should say now is the time for me to get infected, uh, while we while we got a strain that is not very dangerous and highly contagious get that natural immunity and that will move us closer to having this thing go away. Uh, instead, we're being pushed in, a, in the opposite direction. It is unthinkable. Further mandates uh, and further closures. Yeah, and I, I think the, the contrast is pretty, pretty stark uh, when you look at the um, obedience and, and the acquiescence here in the United States and over in Europe, you know, many of these countries that, that we think are far more socialist or more to the left 
are seeing huge, you know, rallies and protests. Against you know, another way in which Rand was uh, was prescient. Every time I look at Fauci, I think Kip Chalmers or Wesley Mouch. Mm-hmm. It's just exactly the guy she predicted. Dr. Stadler, yes. Uh, Dr. Stadler, I forgot about him, but uh, you know, a government bureaucrat, somebody with credentials, uh, Dr. Stadler, uh, uh, that's right. Uh, there are characters out of Atlas Shrug, these uh, folks that you see uh, now in, uh, in the government. Um, uh, it, it is, um, it, it's quite amazing, quite, quite astonishing. I, I never thought I'd live to see the day in America when something, when Atlas Shrugged would be coming through, but it's, true. It's, we're getting there. Yeah. So on the legal front, though, um, so far the courts have not been responding very favorably to uh, the Biden administration's various mandates to make private companies uh, and, and hospitals require vaccinations for employees and healthcare workers. Next week, the Supreme Court um, is set to rule on his mandates through OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Agency. Any thoughts on how yeah. uh, you know these various mandates of their constitutionality and what will that happen? That particular case raises some very complex issues involving administrative law. I think the Fifth Circuit got it exactly right. I think the Sixth Circuit out to lunch, um, but that is very different from uh, from. Um, the majority in the Sixth Circuit. I thought the dissent in the Sixth Circuit was quite good. Uh, but um, the issue is based on administrative law, which is as far removed from common sense as you can possibly imagine. And the ruling the Supreme Court is going to make is not on the merits of the claim, but on whether a stay should be issued. There's a huge difference. Uh, a stay is a prediction of the future and a weighing of the harms from, from staying the policy versus not staying the policy. So I would not take whatever they do in this case, that where they will rule on the stay as being the ultimate words on how they've decided. Um, I do think when they look at it, um, when they look at it on the mirrors, they will find that the policy um, uh, violates uh, basic principles of uh, administrative law. Um, uh, but generally, um, uh, it seems to me, as, uh, putting the administrative law issue aside, uh, it seems to me, I mean, there's one precedent on vaccines, and that goes back to 1902, I believe, uh, mm-hmm. a Jacobson case, in a very different situation, very different body of law, very different uh, uh, legal standard. But aside from anything else, that vaccine, the small fax vaccine, actually stopped infection, actually stopped people from being infectious to each other. So there was at least some justification. I mean, we now have the CDC and the WHO have admitted that it doesn't stop infection. It may make your symptoms mild or not. I, I don't know. I had no symptoms at all and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not vaccinated and I had zero symptoms, but you know, I'm, I am agnostic on that issue. But it seems to me if the only thing it does is make the individual taking the vaccine uh, or the so-called vaccine feel uh, uh, safer or uh, be safer, uh, it seems to me it's not a vaccine at all. It's a, it's a medicine. And the question is, it's therapeutic, do, you, maybe. Do, you, do you think that the risk to you as an individual outweigh of taking the vaccine outweigh uh, the risk from COVID? And, you know, I made my decision one way. Other people can make the decision differently. I don't think people who've taken the vaccine are crazy. I think they're deluded, but not crazy. Uh, but uh, I made my decision and, um, you know, I'm doing fine, but it's my decision. It has nothing to do with infecting anybody else. So I don't see how they could possibly require people to be vaccinated uh, unless they can show that this actually stops transmission. Uh, that's the only possible justification for having uh, something they call a vaccine uh, administered uh, um, involuntarily. Um, uh, I wish I were confident in the outcome of that. Uh, I, I've mm. seen arguments and I'm not sure that there's so many arguments that 
this argument has been given enough weight, but it seems to me that's the key. It's not a vaccine. It's not stopping transmission. End of case. Yeah, well, it, it's also been when you were talking about Anthem earlier and, and the changing of terms and languages to control not just the debate, but the way that people think. Uh, there's there's been a, a lot of that with regards to um, well then then you are into we the learning yeah uh, uh, which is the grimace of our of Rand's novels and for that reason probably my least favorite it reminds me too much of oh dear my early life well you know it was the most autobiographical of of her novels um, and yes it it without being uh, a spoiler, it, it does have uh, less of a heroic um, resolution, but um, but it having been such an early novel, I think as well that there is a naivete, not in, in the sense of you know not knowing things, but the way that she expressed herself, it, it wasn't as stylistic as uh, as she further developed it in her maturity. But, but, but the, you know. Uh, uh, Farm has was published first. Uh, um, uh, we the Living was written before Fountainhead and then got published uh, after Fountainhead. But uh, again, I'm not sure that's I prefer true. the Fountainhead, but there is something about the characters in, in uh, We the Living that is more human. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and maybe that's. Well, and I think maybe that's what I'm saying is that, that the, you know, when you think of uh, naive artists, you know, that they are, um, that, that there is less of a filter, it's less developed, it's less stylized. And I think as, as a younger writer, you know, for example, there are Nietzschean um, elements or reflections in, in some of the language that she used there. And as she developed as a thinker and a, a philosopher, she eschewed. Uh, Nietzsche. So, um, so I think maybe there's something in the way that it's written. It just comes across more naturalistically. So, could be time to read. To, time to reread. And time, definitely my repertoire of books. <laughs> time, time to wrap it up. Uh, so we are getting close to the top of the hour. Uh, Alex, what is next for you? I know you are a man of many hobbies. You tending to your chickens and no actually the chickens are gone the, they're gone we had a couple of foxes move in next door and they cleaned us out we used to lock them up at night the wolf the, with the chickens and the foxes yeah i have <laughs> bees now uh, you have what bees bees okay yeah that'll teach those foxes a lesson uh -huh. aha right. my bees uh, but yeah, we uh, we had chickens for many, many years. They used to run around the property all day and at night they put themselves to bed. They do come home to roost. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, we'd lock them up uh, and because there are night critters around, uh, raccoons and the like. Uh, but then foxes are too much. Uh, they, they clean us out. Uh, what I do is I, I consult. I, I'm, uh, uh, I work with lawyers. Um, who have cases pending in various courts, my own court, but other courts as well. And I work with them in advising them how best to present their cases, what arguments to make, what arguments not to make, uh, how to put together briefs, how to put together uh, arguments, uh, what to leave out, what to include. Um, I, um, a lot of lawyers come to me and say, give us the inside scoop on how judges think. And I did it for 35 years, so I guess I, I'm in a position to give them that insight. And where do people, if they are looking for those services, where do they find you? On the internet. They, they find you, okay. <laughs> they, they, find, they, they manage to find me. I'm in the California Bar. They can look up my information on the California Bar page. But these days it's not hard to get found. All right. Well, good. Well, we are very happy that we found you and that you found Ayn Rand. And uh, this has been absolutely delightful. And we've gotten tremendous feedback already uh, from our viewers, very inspired by, by your courage and your wisdom. And we're very grateful for your time. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. All Thank you. And everyone, um, 
look forward to seeing you next week. I'm going to be interviewing Kara Dansky on uh, the end of sex. She is a self-described TERF, a trans-exclusionary radical feminist, uh, which is actually kind of the the negative term that people um, use for feminists who are raising questions about um, the promotion of a, a transgender agenda and what it means for women's rights, women's um, private spaces, women's sports. So we're gonna be talking about that next week. And again, um, if you're on Clubhouse and you wanna talk about objectivism, join me and um, our organization's founder, David Kelly tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific time, uh, he's going to be talking about objectivism and the arc of life and how the objectivist ethics apply at different stages as we develop from birth to old age. So thanks everyone.